Thank you for joining us for another opportunity of fellowship with This Is My Story, testimonies that move the soul. We are in store for a delightful afternoon of fellowship as we continue our worship experience together this Sabbath. I'm so delighted to be able to welcome our guest and we'll hear from them shortly. But before we do, why don't we enter into a prayer mode? And I'm going to ask if uh, you would, Elder Benjamin, if you would pray. And while he's preparing to do so, would you please remember Viola Davis' son in prayer? She contacted me last night. Unfortunately, her son had a very horrific fall. He was on a ladder. And uh, some of you may know um, that he's a fireman. In fact, Jerry worked with him, but he had a fall off of a ladder, very serious situation. He's currently hospitalized and uh, with an intentional uh, sedative that has him sedated so that he can calm down from what has happened. A lot has happened. He's been um, extremely um, combative and has a, a pretty serious head in his And as you would imagine, Viola is very concerned and she's asked if we would please remember her in prayer and her son, those who are attending to them. So I want to share that with you along with all the other prayer requests we'll go into a little bit later. But I wanted to share that with you because as you know, Viola usually is the individual that leads us in prayer. So the Benjamin has to lead us in prayer this afternoon. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we bow in your presence, O God, and we, we come down from all across this land. We come to God with thankful hearts for your grace and your mercies, allowing us, oh God, the privilege of being able to experience these holy hours. Pray, oh God, that our worship of prayers or, or, or to you, Lord, is acceptable in your sight. We ask, oh God, that you would forgive us our sins, cleanse us from unrighteousness. Create within us a clean heart, a right spirit. Heavenly Father, you are our God. And you bid us come. You told us to come boldly to your throne of grace. Because that's where we find mercy. That's why we find grace. That's where we find love. So we thank you, Lord, and we praise your holy name. We want to present to you, Lord. Not that you don't know or understand, but Viola or their sister and her son, to be more specific. Thank you, dear God, that you protected him when he fell from that ladder. That the news we, 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 we received was, was not news that he had expired, Lord. But, oh God, he is injured, he's damaged. And we pray, Lord, we pray, Lord, that you would heal his body, oh God. A young man, oh God. We pray, oh Lord, that your healing hands would just reach out and touch him, even now, Lord, in hospital, wherever he is laid up. We pray, O oh God, that you would restore him, Lord. Restore him, O oh God, to health even uh, healthier than before he fell. Heavenly Father, we pray that you'd be with Viola. Comfort her heart. We know exactly, you know, Lord, how it feels to see your son. Injured, damaged. So, Lord, comfort her heart, oh God, as only you can. Be with the doctors and nurses that attend him, Lord. 
give them the wisdom knowledge that they need to do your bidding. Heavenly Father, there are so many other prayer requests that individuals have been challenged with. Even this week, I think of Brother Harold, who is down in bed right now. I pray, oh God, that you be with him. Touch his body and heal him, oh God, from his medical challenges. Pray for all the other individuals and pray for those mothers and fathers, oh God, and brothers and sisters that are dealing, oh God, with, with sick siblings and individuals, family members. Have mercy, oh God. Draw near to those, oh God, that are in mourning. Be with them, comfort their hearts, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the blessed hope that is ours. The blessed hope, oh God, that comforts our heart in that, knowing that our loved ones, those that know you, we look forward to seeing them again when you come in the clouds of glory. But, oh God, as we miss them, as we, we mourn them, we pray, oh God, that you be with us. Be with our speakers today as they share their story with us. We ask, oh God, that your Holy Spirit would be with them. Help us to hear that which, oh God, will bless our souls. That which, oh God, would motivate us to have a closer walk with you. That which, oh God, would help us to understand and see what a great, loving, merciful God you are. Bless this platform. Bless our host, Sister Debbie, Brother Jerry. Bless them. Bless their home. And continue, God, to bless others through them. Thank you for each household and individual represented on this platform today. May we all leave this meeting, this gathering, this fellowship, with joy in our hearts because we had a closer glimpse of you there, God, of your love, grace, and mercy. We thank you and we praise you for answered prayer and for hearing and answering this prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much, Elder Benjamin. Appreciate your willingness to pray. We'll chat a little bit more about Viola and I'll share with you the text. Before I introduce our guests, I don't know if they're on, uh, but I need to acknowledge that there are three individuals who have had birthdays over the course of a few days. And I just want to give a shout out to them. Uh, if they're on, we just want to wish them happy birthday. Linda Swain, whose birthday actually was yesterday, and uh, she may be on. And then there's Lori Crawford, and then there's Francine Umari. And so we just like to wish them happy birthday. Let them know that we wish them God's deepest. I, sorry, my birthday was, on, was Thursday, Thanksgiving. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, Donna, is that you? Yeah. What my were you saying? Was, my birthday was no the 25th, th Thanksgiving Day. Okay. Happy birthday to you as well. Very good. Thank, Thank you for, for sharing that. So there's four birthdays now, and we just want to wish everyone a wonderful birthday. We hope that you've had a delightful birthday and that it's filled with many more blessings to come. I'll now ask you if everyone please mute, and if not, I will assist you in making sure that you are muted. As we begin our time together of fellowship, I'm delighted to be able to welcome our two guests. One that comes to us this afternoon from the East Coast, Allegheny East Conference, I believe. And then our second guest, uh, equally the same, coming to us from the West Coast. 
And uh, Elder Leggett currently is in ministry there on the East Coast. He actually is engaged in an ongoing ministry with a presentation as recently in the past few months that he's been actively engaged in. But he has had a deep abiding commitment to ministry for a long time. And that perhaps is the same way it could be described for the commitment to his wife. A love affair, a deep love affair. We hear about them and we read about them. We watch them on television and soap operas have tried to recreate them. But when you are able to be up close and in person with the observance of a love affair, it certainly does make a difference. L.D. Leggett has some rich truths that he is going to be able to share with us about his love affair with Christ and what has impressed him as he has served as a pastor, a father, but more importantly, a husband. You may have noted in my remarks of introduction when inviting you to this afternoon, I liken these two gentlemen to Jacob. As far as I could remember, Jacob was the first one that I could reach back to who spoke of his love affair, where it was written and shared about how deeply he loved Rachel. Well, our second guest is not to be excluded when it comes to love affair. We had a wonderful public marriage here on the West Coast. And perhaps it was the African-American Barbie and Ken or maybe it was the modern day uh, Barack and Michelle Obama. However you looked at it, when you looked upon them, you knew that they were one. And while both of them have hidden secrets about what makes a successful marriage, how to keep your marriage sparkling, how to keep it engaged, they like Jacob share something else that is much more deeper and I'm sure it's one experience that none of us is signing up to be a part of. They have one thing in common with Jacob, gone far too soon. So I'm going to invite our guest. Our first guest is going to, we're gonna invite them first to uh, be able to share uh, their experiences, how they met their wives, and uh, what they found that allowed them to make the decision to say, this is the one. And then we're going to, after each one shares, then we're gonna find out what took place, what occurred that made them uh, have the experiences like Jacob. And then we'll engage in some things, it'll be a Q and A but for right now, we're going to start uh, uh, with Elder Leggett. Are you there? I know, I think I hear you and I know Michael is here, Professor May. So uh, Elder Leggett, thank you for being here this afternoon. It's wonderful to have you, happy Sabbath. I know the sun is down where you are on the East Coast. Yes. So you've already yes. completed your worship experience and thank you for being here. Uh, let's pleasure. talk with you first about uh, what it was like to meet Angela and where you met her and how did you get to the point where you said, okay, she's the one, take us on that journey when you first encountered Angela. Um, I'm gonna start with, um, I believe it was two weeks ago. It was whatever, whatever two weeks ago, three weeks ago, it was November 8th um, of this month. I flew back down to Lake Placid, Florida. Um, and I went back to the very same resort where Angela walked into my life. And I, re and I recorded the story, okay? I recorded the story of how we met. Now, some of you may have seen it, some of you may not, but, but here's the story, 30 years ago. Um, it was August 1991. I was in my living room with my children. I had just completed worship that morning, that weekday morning. Um, and we were on our knees. I was concluding the prayer 
when the phone rang. So got up, answered the phone. The gentleman on the other end said, can I speak to you, Pastor Leggett? I said, speaking. He said, uh, hi, I'm, I am Elder S.J. Jackson. I'm the Family Life Director for the Southeastern Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. How you doing? I'm, I'm great. He said, I was recommended to you by your Family Life Director, Dr. A.R. Jones, who, who used to be my pastor, who baptized me as a little boy. And I'm not going to tell you how many years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah a, a, a long time ago when I was a, when I was a little boy. Um, he said, I, I, uh, he recommended me to you because I had, Elder Jackson said, I had brought speakers in, male speakers. Some of them were pastors and they were married and the women let me know they were not happy. So, so I'm looking for, can you give me a recommendation for a single pastor in your conference? And um, as you would, as the Holy Ghost would have it, a couple of weeks earlier, a couple of months earlier, I shared with my former pastor, Dr. Jones, that I had a presentation that I was excited about doing for singles. And so, and so Dr. Jones recommends me, Elder Jackson calls me, and the event, that was August, the event was gonna take place in November. So we correspond back and forth. He sends me my plane arrangements, my flight arrangements. I sent him all of the outlines for the information that uh, um, for the presentations I was going to make. And then it's Friday morning, November 8th. In fact, you on the West Coast will remember it because that was the very day that Magic Johnson came forward and declared he was HIV positive and was retiring from the, N uh, from the NBA. Same day. It's six o'clock that morning. The phone rings. It, 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 it awakens me. And it's my girlfriend. Now, when the phone rang back in August, I hang up the phone and I said, wow, I just been invited to participate in a singles retreat and I'm going to take you with me. Well, between August and November, things didn't go well. And, um, and, I, and she was not going with me and, and, and she called me and we had a conversation. That conversation didn't go well and the, the, and, the, and the relationship ended on the phone that day. And I hung up the phone and I sat, I sat by the side of the bed contemplating what had just happened and what was about to happen. And I had a conversation with Frank Leggett. I, I talked. And frankly, get listen. And here's what I said. I said, Frank, you're about to go down here today. You're gonna fly into Orlando. You're gonna drive a couple of hours. You, Elder Jackson, and the other speaker, Dr. Janice Brown. And you're gonna go down there. You're gonna meet some incredible people. More importantly, you're gonna meet some incredible women. And you're gonna have a great time because you are a really friendly guy. You're gonna mix, you're gonna mingle. But, you are not coming back with any numbers. You're not gonna meet anybody. You're not gonna be talking to anybody. You're not gonna enter in, into a relationship with anybody at this singles retreat, retreat that weekend. Why? Because you need time to heal. That was the plan and I accepted the plan and I got on the plane and I went to Florida and I, and I got there and I am so proud of myself. I am so proud of myself. I executed that plan to perfect Perfection until Friday night, about eight o'clock, and this gorgeous woman woman walked in the door to my left, and I followed and I followed her. I'm talking. I'm presenting now. I'm up and I'm presenting. So from my vantage point, I can see I can see all of the latecomers, right? And I can see them. And she walked, and so I, you know, I I, I can't. I wasn't checking them out. But I could see all of them as they came in. And I see her, she comes in, and I said, who is that to myself? And so the next morning, breakfast time, I have my tray, and I come, and I come to the door, to the entrance of the cafeteria, and I'm looking for one person. 
is that sister. I don't even know her name, but I'm looking for her and I see her and I go to her table and I sit as close to her as I possibly could sit because I got questions. My question was, was she as, was she as gorgeous on the inside as she was on the outside? Did she, did she have a sense of humor? I love a woman who knows how to laugh, who has a sense of humor, who doesn't take herself too seriously. Does she have a boyfriend? And so I sat next to her, we talked, we, you know, we got to introduce each other and whole nine yards. Then was time, then was time to go. And I had the 11 o'clock, I had the 11 o'clock service. And I do my presentation and then it's Q&A session and hands go up, hands go, because they got questions. And so, and so I acknowledged Angela probably because I was smitten and blown away. I acknowledged her in spite of the fact that there were other hands, but, but, and so Angela starts talking and then I could see that there's a young lady to my left. She's got this look on her face, like, like I overlooked her. So I stopped Angela mid-sentence. I said, Angela, hold on for a minute. And I went to the young lady and she said, she, you know, she made her comments and then I came back to Angela and I observed everything she did. While that woman is talking, I'm watching Angela. She didn't get upset. She didn't get angry. She wasn't perturbed. She wasn't disturbed. She was none of that. She handled it gracefully. I said, wow. So then lunchtime, lunchtime, I'm back at girlfriend's table and I discover she's got a boyfriend. Okay, all right. Uh, but but I decided, look, I'm gonna get to know her in the event that that doesn't work. And so we go back and then Saturday night is game night and we're playing this game and every, and we're playing games and, and unbeknownst to her, every group and you know, we would, there were different groups. Every group she was in, I was in. She didn't even know it. I was, you know, some people call it stalking. I wasn't stalking. I was just checking the sister out. And then we got to playing this, this game. There was a lot of movement to it. And girlfriend, girlfriend slipped and fell. She didn't hurt herself. She, you know, she laughed. And then she went off to the side and I politely excused myself. She went over there to the side, to my right, and she sat down. And I politely walked over to her and I said, are you okay? Because here was my message. Here's what I need you, here's what I need everybody to know about Frank Leggett. I'm old school. I, and and when, when I'm attracted to a woman, I'm all in. I don't know how to do it any other way. I'm putting my cards on a table. Um, I'm coming with all the muster that, all, all, all of the passion I can muster, I'm all in. I'm not playing any games. I'm all in. And I wanted her to know, I was making a statement. I wanted her to know that that which was important to her was important to me. So if she fell and he hurt herself, that was important to me. And then a Saturday night, um, no, that was game night. So next day, next day, next day, um, cafeteria, we're in the calf. And uh, this is 30 years ago, y'all. I remember, it, I remember it like it was yesterday. We're in the calf and I go, I'm done with breakfast. Um, and I go to take my tray back and coming from the cab, just emptying her tray was Angela. And I said, I said, Ann, um, after this weekend, let's stay in touch. She said, of course. And so then, then it's the very last session and there was a booklet. I wish I had it. I wish I had it. I didn't even think about bringing the booklet, but I have the booklet from that weekend, 30 years ago. And so they were passing booklets around and everybody was writing their information on each other's booklet and her, a booklet came along and it had Angela's number information on it, but it had no phone number. And I was at the very last meeting and I didn't have girlfriend's phone number and I'm not leaving without her phone number. So I go over to her and said, Ann, with my book, Ann, please give me your information. She gave me all her information. I walked them to the van. Um, and I said, how long is it going to take you to get home? She said, um, about three, four hours. I'm checking my watch because girlfriend's about to get a call. She don't even, she don't even know girlfriend's about to get a call from me. So 
Uh, the Jackson takes us back to the Apopka um, Orlando area and we're at Olive Garden and I'm timing it. And when I thought the timing was right, I got it from the table. I got it from the table and I went to the pay phone and I called and a female answered the phone. I said, hello, can I speak to Angela? He says, speaking. I said, do you know who this is? She said, keep talking. The voice sounds familiar. I said, I was with you the entire weekend. She said, Pastor Leggett? I said, look, look, I know you have a friend, but here's what I want and need you to know. I want you to know that not only am I interested, I'm very interested. And if that doesn't work, I want you to call me. So we talked a little bit, but you know, I was a guest and I didn't want to be rude. So into the conversation, we're back to the table. Next morning, I fly back to New Jersey. She's from Florida, fly back to Jersey. I called her Monday night. We talked an hour or two. I called her Tuesday. Now, back in those days, it's, it's 1991. There was no one price, you know, and every, every long distance call was a long distance call. I called her Tuesday. We talked two hours. I knew I was getting somewhere when girlfriend said to me, um, look, I'm going to have to call. I'm going to, I'm going to have to call my friend because he needs to know that I met somebody. Now, when she went to the event, uh, before she left, uh, he found out, she told him, he said, why are you going? She said, because I'm single. She had wanted, they had been dating, but there was no commitment. She had wanted the relationship to go to the next level, like, a, like most women do, but he had a bunch of excuses. So she called him. So I called her Wednesday. We talked a couple of hours. I called her Thursday. We talked a couple of hours. I called her Friday. I didn't call Sabbath because he came on Sabbath. She called me Sunday morning. Something happened that he did on Saturday evening that frightened her and scared her and raised a red flag. She ended the relationship. And then he revealed, because he had been telling her that they that he was not yet divorced, and he revealed that he was already divorced. He said, oh, so, oh, oh, so you've been lying to me. <laughs> he was done. She called me. That was November 17, 1991. All righty. We've, we've, been, we've been together ever since until she passed September 3rd, 2021. So put a pin in that elder Leggett. You have us on the edge of our seat. I'm gonna come back with you with the next follow-up. Let's hear from Elder May. Tell us what you remember from your first encounter. And when did you decide, Michael, that you wanted to have this be something of permanence? Well, I wish I could say I had a story like he did, but- uh, <laughs> Hey, we, Mike, how you doing, Mike? We're gonna make yours a movie, Frank, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I just I just want to be in the front seat when I watch it, you know? I, yes, I, sir. I, so uh, I was uh, blessed to grow up in a loving family. And um, we were, I was raised in a black uh, environment until I was in fourth grade. And then we moved across the Bay from Richmond all the way over to Sunnyvale, which is by San Jose, which is just the opposite, uh, almost completely white. Matter of fact, I was the dot on the page. So um, I grew up from fifth grade through basically 12th grade in a white environment. So for me, it was paramount that I go to Oakwood so that I could see what black Mecca was all about especially in terms of Adventism. My sister graduated early at the end of her junior year. I have a twin sister and she went away to Oakwood in August and I was gonna enjoy my senior year, but as fate would have it, I ended up graduating at Christmas and going to Oakwood in January. I had just turned 17 a couple of months before and I went with my older brother who was 11 and a half years older than me. When we got to Oakwood, he was able to get me to stay in the upperclassmen's dorm with him. Um, freshmen were not allowed to have cars, and I did not, but my brother did, who was my roommate. Um, we had to go down to the to make calls. 
I did not because my brother put a phone in our room. So I was living large as a freshman at Oakwood and I had family there, my brother and my sister. So I knew people. And the second week that I was at Oakwood, I came into the lobby of Edwards Hall and this beautiful woman who was sitting across the room who I had not noticed when I first entered, jumped up and ran over and confronted me in the evening. It was an evening, uh, late, you know, maybe about 10 and confronted me by the door. She was like, are you Michael Main?" And seeing this beautiful woman standing in front of me, asking me, my it was like, I'm whoever you want me to be, you know, it doesn't matter now. You know, I was just, I was, I was amazed. I had, you know, this is stuff for movies. And she said, really, are you Michael May? And I'm like, yes, I am. And she said, you have to understand, I have to do this. And she started looking up and down the hallway. And I started looking up and down the hallway and I'm like, do what? She said, I just, I just have to do this. And I'm like, okay. And she grabbed me and kissed me and kissed me passionately and then turned and ran out the door. And I was standing like any other 17 year old man would do who had just been to Mecca and seen the mountaintop and the light had shone in and I didn't know what to do or where to go. And I was just like, what, what just happened? And uh, then every time she saw me, she made sure to disappear. So I'd see her come in the cafeteria and then she would disappear. I'd see her at a game and then she would disappear. And unbeknownst to me, she was embarrassed at the fact that she had done such a thing because she and some of her friends were playing truth or dare. And she took the dare being who she was and the dare said, go kiss Michael May. And so that's why she did it. I didn't know why. And I didn't care. I just thank God for his multiple blessings towards me. And that's how we met. And uh, she never talked to me. Wouldn't, wouldn't give me the time of day hiding from me, as a matter of fact. So one day I saw her coming and I hid around a corner. And when she was just about to pass by that corner, I stepped out in front of her. And she tried to, she was stunned. And then she tried to run and I kind of grabbed her arm and I was like, what, what is this? You know, you use me, you get what you want. And then you, you don't have time for me. You can't even tell me your name, which I already knew, but it was a great in line. And so we started talking and we became friends. Uh, I was very poor at Oakwood. Um, probably better way to say it would be Po because uh, we just didn't have anything. Uh, it took everything to get there and then to stay in school. And so I could only do the activities. And every time I would come to her dorm, she was leaving. So she was very active. Little did I know till later, coming from a small town, Berrien Springs, Michigan, she gets to Huntsville, which was not really a big town. But since there was so many more activities, she was trying to get into everything. And uh, everybody would take her places and she would just enjoy going. So we became friends, needless to say. We didn't date at Oakwood. She dated one of my very good friends. And so I was very happy that she was happy and they were happy and we stayed in touch. And years later, um, after graduating from Oakwood and The Ohio State University, I'm back in California and she and I maybe communicated once a year, just the call or a letter or something. Um, one of my friends sent me a picture of her that she had won Miss Southwest Michigan as a, a, a beauty contestant, which she was not, she felt that that had a stigma. So she didn't like people to know that she was a beauty queen. And I was really amazed and talked to her. You know, I called her with her number on there. He put her number on there and we called and talked. And after that, we just basically stayed in touch once a year. And then I got into a relationship and it was moving. And I thought I was going to get married. I was engaged. And I saw Val at alumni weekend and I had gone to this alumni weekend and my fiance couldn't. And I was letting all my friends know that we were getting married and this was the date and all this other kind of stuff. And then I saw Val and I told her, you know, I'm getting married, you know, but um, friendship is friendship. And just because you get married doesn't mean that you have to lose all of your friends from the opposite side. 
I said, so know that our home in California will be open to you. And uh, I left and went back. And as fate would have it, and when I say fate, I mean God's uh, providential fate, <laughs> uh, that my fiance and I broke up. And the night we broke up, Val called me. Now, I didn't remember that because that night I was distraught. I mean, you know, and she reminded me of that because when she called me, she said, well, how you doing? I said, not good. I said, I just, you know, we just ended it. And so I don't really remember the conversation much more than what she told me. And, um, you know, we communicated, I think once, and I told her, you know, just where I was at kind of distraught. And she, I went away on what would have been the honeymoon with my brother and we enjoyed ourselves at a club med. And when I came back, there were five phone calls from Val who calls me maybe once a year, five phone calls. And I was like, well, what's going on? So I called her and she said, um, I, I just wanted to know, are you serious about your invitation to come to California? And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, you said I could come to California if I ever needed to and that you'd have a place for me. And I said, well, of course I meant that. She said, well, I'm, I'd like to come this Friday. And this was Wednesday. And I was like, are you serious? And she was like, yeah. Turns out she had been in a very bad relationship and the guy she was in the relationship with tried to become physical with her and her mom wanted her to get out of town for a little while and said, look, don't you have a friend in California? And her mom bought her a ticket to come to California. And so uh, I picked her up and I was coming out of a bad relationship and she was coming out of a bad relationship. And that week was just, it, it could not have been better. It was, it was too good to be true. And that's how we categorize it. And so when she went back to Michigan, we were like, okay, let's, let's, let's be realistic about this. You're in Michigan. I'm in California. You were coming out of a bad relationship. I was coming out of a bad relationship. I've always had great admiration for you. You've had great admiration for me. So let's not get this thing, you know, out of whack. But the truth was, it was just that good the whole time that we were together and it blossomed, and then she moved to California. But in answer to your second question, the time that I knew was, she had been staying with my sister when she came out to visit that week. And on the second day or so, or the third day, I called her and I was going over what the plans for the day was, and she was like, well, how's your mother? And I was like, what? And she said, how's your mother doing? I said, well, because I was staying with my mother at the time. And she was like, I said, well, mom's okay. And she said, no, she was complaining about her back. And I told her, I said, well, mom always complains about something. You know, that's just the, where she is in her life right now. And she said to me, you should check on her. And I said, very interesting. She cared about my mother, but she didn't care about getting credit for it. So she wanted me to check on her. She didn't say, tell your mom I asked about her. She didn't say anything like that. She just wanted to make sure that my mother was okay and she didn't care if she got credit for it or not. And that's the kind of loving person she was. She cared about others without having any thought for herself or about herself being put on a pedestal or no, any kind of acknowledgement that she cared. She just cared about it. And at her memorial, Marshila Fennison gave a very good analogy of that and how Val had just you know, run up on her one day at church when she was in a bad way and just blessed her. So that's, that's when I knew it was like this, this girl is special. She's not only beautiful on the outside, but man, she's really loving on the inside. And uh, very nice gentlemen. So thank you, uh, Mike. Let, you let me mention to Frank. She passed Frank's uh, September 21st. Wow. 2019. 2019? 2019, September 21st. Wow, I'm sorry to hear that, Mike. And I didn't answer, Deb, I didn't answer that last question, so, but you can you can go ahead if you, if you want. Go to. ahead, go ahead. Feel free to answer. You want me to answer? You want Surely. me to answer it? Surely. Now, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of private question. I mean, I've shared it, but if y'all don't, if y'all don't hold it against me, I'll go ahead and share it. Um, so Ann and I, Ann and I start talking, um, and we're three, we're three weeks in, 
and I'm talking to her every day. Our phone bills are two, three, four hundred dollars. Um, and so there's no internet back in the day, right? Um, there's no, there's no Zoom, there's no, no stream yard. So we only have telephone to be able to communicate with. And I have to keep the phones on. So, you know, I'm paying, I'm helping to keep her phone bill on whole nine yards. It's, it's the first week in December. We talk every single day got sent. And I like everything I hear. And I got to tell you this, I got to tell you this, and all men have, have things that we like about a woman. I'm a boob man. And that weekend I had no idea. Um, and so I asked one day, so, you know, what, 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 what size are you? And she told me, I got, I got in my, I got in my car. I drove to Macy's. It's first week in December, it's freezing outside. I couldn't have cared less. I drove to Macy's and I went in the lingerie section, I had a great revelation that day. I didn't know anything about underwires. I had no, I had no idea what all of that was. And I'm on a section and I don't see the number. And I'm saying, wait, something, something's wrong. And I look across the mic, I look across the hall, uh, I look across the room and I see, all right, there's a pathway and there's, this bra's on the other side. And I go over there and the numbers go up and then there's underwires. And I found the number and I held it up in the air and I said, oh my God, oh my God, we could do this. <laughs> um, it was the only thing that I did not know that I needed to know. And um, I knew she was a, a, a longtime Seventh-day Adventist. And I knew, I knew everything else that was, and that's important to me. That may not be important to any other man on the planet. That was important to me, all right? Because I like what I like and I want what I want. And I got, I got everything I wanted. And then some, and, and then some. Okay, so Pastor Leggett, I want to give everybody a moment to resuscitate themselves. <laughs> I told you, I told you it was private. I told you it was private. Pleading my happy self. <laughs> so you all have some similarities between them. I don't know about the Macy rendezvous, but you were no, both. I don't have that. I don't have that one, but he looked beyond our faults and saw our needs. Come on, I, did. Come sure on did. <laughs> I noticed that you both have long distance relationships. You were both yes. communicating by phone. You were both yeah. dealing with breakups where there yes. was a breakup and fallout of relationship. I noticed uh -huh. early on from your first uh, comments, Elder Leggett, that uh, you indicated before you went to the singles event, you had determined with yourself, you had a conversation with yourself, self, you will not leave there with any phone numbers. I think self took wings and flew away and something else took over. And it's so interesting because gentlemen, when you are uh, mesmerized and in the company of these women, it seems as though what you think you may do is not what you're doing. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I held on to that plan from 6 a.m. until 8 p.m. when she walked in the door and it went completely out the window. How old were you, Frank? I'm sorry? How old were you? I was, she was 39, I was 38. Um, well, I, I, I was two. I was 28 and 29 when we actually got married. But um, being 27 and having dealt with some relationships and stuff and her being 28, uh, it, it helped us to have gotten past all the, I think, I think, I think. And also recognizing that we just don't know. And if God is not leading, then we will never be um, sure of what we have in store. Because, you know, we know what's good to us, but he knows what's good for us. And it's not until you learn to trust him 
that he gives you the desires of your heart. Like Frank said, I mean, let's just be honest. I, I always thought that things were going to go differently for me. And, and even in the relationship that I was in it, there were many issues that actually manifested themselves more, but even in terms of the attraction that I had, there was still, um, some, it was not all that I wanted. I did not, I wasn't looking for the whole package. Now it was like, you know, let's, let's deal with realistically, there are going to be some issues. And so don't be shallow and just look at the outside, learn to look at the inside. And when I let go of that relationship and got bow, it was, I felt actually um, sad that my former relationship, I didn't want to flaunt how good Val was in front of my former girlfriend. It's like, look, I got the whole package here and you were only a half of it or three quarters of it, but she's the whole thing. Look at her, you know? And so I felt bad about it a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you, you got over it. Hey, but Deb, but Deb I, I, I didn't tell you the right thing. I knew that weekend. Here's what I knew that weekend. We went out, I was out on the pier that afternoon, that Sabbath afternoon, and I was talking to talking to you know two young ladies that I that I had met, casual conversation, and Angela and her friend Vivine walked by me. Now, when you're old school like me and you're at a singles retreat, you know you got to handle your business because you only have so much time. So I excused myself and I went down to the end of the pier with them. We talked. Um, and then she and I walked back down because it was time to go back in. And here's what she said to me that blew me away. I said, oh, my gosh. She said, I know that I'm the marrying kind. And I know that I want to be married again. And here's what I heard. I heard what she said, but here's what I heard. I want to be in a relationship. Um, I know how to take care of a man. I know how to please a man. Hold on, yours. It blew me away. I knew then and there I was going after girlfriend. I knew right then and there because I knew that she was like me. She wasn't playing games and I wasn't playing games. We we're too old to be playing games. She's 39, I'm 38. I knew, I knew right then and there. Girl, uh, homeboy, he better get ready because I'm coming. So gentlemen, You've already indicated and shared with our, our audience today that both of them, unfortunately, gone far too soon. Uh, take us into your journey that led to them leaving and the love affair that, uh, what has that love affair taught you in terms of your relationship? Not just your relationship with each other, but moving forward. What has it taught you? So Mike, I'm gonna start with you. Well, the good news there is I don't follow a good pastor and, and uh, run second on that. Uh, I'm gonna set the pace for you. Um, we had a great relationship. And part of that great relationship was growing together. I have not, did not realize it till after I had lost her, how much we had grown up together. Um, and how initially she had not wanted to get married. She didn't want to have kids, but she always laughed and talked about everything she said she wasn't going to do. She did. And, um, she had a lot of allergies and a lot of physical issues when we first got married. Um, and she got past the allergies. She got past the, I mean, literally just changing her diet helped change some stuff. And so, I was instrumental in changing her diet and getting her to exercise more and increasing her faith. She had a faith and she had a love, but Adventism had, how do I say it nicely, had scarred her. And, and those scars were deep because she felt that it was just so much hypocrisy in the church that why even go to church? And after recognizing that you don't go to church looking at people, because you will always find people who will dissuade you from what you believe look to Jesus and bring him with you to church and other people will find him through you and she grew in the knowledge of him and grew to be a person who was working in the church 
who other people looked up to. She was insecure in the beginning, but became strong. She became a strong woman. Um, today in our Sabbath school class, one of the things that was brought out that was powerful was in, a, in there is really no perfect marriage, but in a perfect marriage per se, you love the imperfections of your spouse completely. And that's what Christ does for us. He loves our imperfections. And so our relationship grew and was blessed and developed. And we have two beautiful children that came from it. And oh. I was very honored to be called her husband. Uh, she was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2016 and completely changed her diet. I mean, she started juicing the first year. She lost a lot of weight, would not eat sugar just completely because she wanted to eradicate the cause of the cancer and not just the cancer itself, but what caused it instead of, you know, the symptoms of it. So she really fought to, to eradicate it from her body. But I believe um, because of the fact that her body had a lot of maladies when we were young, that it kind of caught up to her. And she uh, so became, started showing symptoms in 2019 and basically went downhill um, when she passed in 2020 or sorry, 2019, we weren't really expecting her to pass. We took her to the hospital because um, the catheter that she had for her lungs to a drain was clogged. And we thought that they were just going to unclog it and like, well, we've got to run some other tests. And when she came home an hour after she came home, she passed basically. Uh, it was a blessing for me in that I was with her the whole time. Uh, it was a blessing because my children had been, had had the chance to reconcile with their mother. My youngest came home from Oakwood in December and was there all the way through till September when she passed. My oldest came home in July and was able to reconcile with his mom, any issues that they had before she passed. And they were able as the caregiver, you see them suffering and you understand um, that, that death can be merciful. Um, and, and people talk about praying for healing in their life. You know, uh, longevity doesn't mean anything if you're in pain and if you're struggling and if you're, you're facing maladies. It's more like a prison. And people don't really understand that because people just think selfishly, I want you to live forever. I, I, I would love her to be healed, but I would love her to be healed completely back into the state that she was in before the sickness came, not in a state just to keep her alive. So um, understanding that God knows what's best. And someone said something to me that helped me in the process. They said, what if you knew that when she died, it was the perfect time for her salvation into God's kingdom? would you want her to come back? And my answer was resoundingly, no, no. I mean, our goal is the king. That's the goal. God wants us in his kingdom. He doesn't want us to live forever here. He wants to get us in the kingdom. So whatever he does here that helps get us in the kingdom is what's most important. And when you realize that you can't be sad, you can't be sad that she is not suffering down here with us as we are suffering. And we are the ones suffering, you know, now. When I think of her, I have no pain. I am grateful to God that he took her and that she is at peace. It's when I think of me without her that, that I have pain and sorrow. And it, there's, a, there's a spiritual lesson in that. You know, looking unto him, there's no pain. But looking at myself, you know, mm, mercy. So, uh, Mike... Uh, one final thought before we move that and go to Pastor Leggett. What for you is quantity versus quality? Quantity, the length of time versus the quality of time. How... Well, it... go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Interesting you should say that. Um, as a professor, many things I teach in my classes in a math class, but I teach it because it's a life skill. There's two things you want out of every relationship. You want longevity and you want happiness. One without the other is vain. 
If it's long, but it's not happy, it's like prison. And if it's happy, but it's not long, then you're always looking back. Man, that one summer was great. Man, that one summer was great. When can I ever get back there? So whether it's work, family, love, spouse, longevity, and happiness. And we had both. We had both. It, it was almost 31 years. And I don't look back and say I didn't. Because the people who I shared her with knew how deeply, she, you knew how deeply she loved you, you know, personally. And the people who are on this call who met her knew how she gravitated to them and took care of them and loved them deeply. But I had that for myself. I had that when nobody else was looking. I had that when I was sick, when I was happy. I had that to bol bolster me and help shape me into the man that I am today. And I credit her love and I credit her her devotion to helping me be the man that I am today. And so long is good. Long is good, but but happy is better. And one day we'll be with him forever. And so it will be just a, a, a small piece of what we've felt down here and dealt with down here on this earth compared to being with God forever in his kingdom. So I, I, I can't I can't look at this and, and, and be sad because of what I dealt with here on this earth. And, and I mentioned it at her memorial and I'll say it again. Don't cry for me because I had her. She was mine. I was her choice. And I thank God that he trusted her in my care, in my possession. And, and I look forward to that. I mean, I look back at that and I say, you know, thank you, Jesus. It was a blessing. It was a joy. It was exciting. But I, you know, the, the song says, can't plow straight, keep it looking back. So now the question is, how do you go forward? And I go forward in anticipation that the same God, you know, who gave me the Maserati can do whatever he will with my life. His goal is to get me in the kingdom, not just make me happy. And so I'm looking to get in his kingdom and I trust him in whatever he has in store for me. I trust him. Amen. You read my mind as I was going there. I recall at the service when you said, hey, don't cry for me. And there was a certain awe about you, a certain amount of peace and acceptance. Long before she actually passed, you had that awe about you even before, because it seemed as though you were at peace and you knew it all was in God's hands. And it would appear that God has uh, shaped and molded you as you've taken that journey, becoming a part. Well, I, I, I have to say, like, you know, and I'm sure that if, there are so many people who are on this call who have lost spouses. Mm -hmm. and, and I see you and and they will attest to this. Prayer changes things because there are times when we are alone and we are in tears. This the, the Christmas season is a tough season for me because we were married on Christmas Eve. And so the joy of Christmas and what the world calls love, we should have all year long. But it especially was a special time for me because that's the one time when I'm away from both schools, when I have the most time to spend and to share. And to, you know, this time when everybody is willing to give and that should be what it should be about all year long. But, but the prayers of the saints, I have to say, there are people on this call who I know prayed for me. And there are people on this call who I have prayed for sincerely, who have experienced loss. And we'll tell you, we will tell you that we don't know how we made it. And we don't know how we're making it. Yeah. You know, people ask me, well, how did you do it? And it's like, I can't tell you. There is no way to prepare for the loss. It's not possible. So, and there is no good time for your, for your spouse to die. It's not possible, but you learn to make good. And I think that the best way to describe it is your focus. What do you focus on? I gave the analogy to you, Deb, and I'll just say it for the people who are here. I said, I felt like after she passed, I woke up in a hospital after a car accident. This is how I felt. And my legs had been amputated, like I had uh, lost my legs. And I knew life will never be the same.
because I'll never be able to run like I used to run or play football or dunk a basketball or any of the things I used to do. So life is going to be different. But that doesn't mean life ends. Right. And so the question is, how will you move forward and what will you focus on? And that will determine your altitude. Very good. Thank you for your transparency with that. You and I have had several conversations and you zeroed in on all of that. Elder Leggett, take us uh, through the journey that leads to gone too soon for Angela. Um, Thursday night, August 5, I come down with what I, 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 I got up to go to bed. It's 11, 11.30. I got up to go to bed and my living room is adjacent to my bedroom. And by the time I leave the couch and um, almost at the bed, there's this most incredible tiredness of that, that, I, that I've never felt in my life. Um, I suspect it's COVID and I go get a test on Sabbath and it turns out positive. Uh, within a couple of days, Angela's positive. My 87 year old mother is positive. My 62 year old brother is positive. Um, and goes in the hospital. Um, and she goes into crisis. And I was able to go to, I was able to go into the ICU with her. Um, and I was there for about an hour or so, helping her breathe because the oxygen levels kept falling and I was coaching her. And, and I said, all right, baby, come on, let's breathe. And the numbers would go up. Then the doctor came in and he kicked me out the room. I, I, went home I, I went home and I fell on my bed because I didn't know if I'd ever see my, my wife alive again. And a couple of hours went by and I, I was, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself. Um, and I was still in bed. I knew I had stuff to do. I have a I have a uh, invalid mother. I bathe her every morning. I get her dressed. I feed her, take her to the bathroom, clean her up after the bathroom. I do everything for her because she can do nothing for herself. And I'm still in bed because I just can't, I can't, I can't picture, I can't picture life without my wife. A couple hours go by and the phone rings and it says, Angela. And I screamed in her ear. I said, Ann. And she said, I'm still here. She fought a good fight, but a couple of weeks, a couple of weeks later, she passed. And the hospital called me. And I went to the hospital and I gowned up and I stood outside the door. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do in my life. It was worse than I had a funeral and a memorial service for here, a funeral in Florida, memorial service at my church in Pennsylvania. It's worse than either one of those. In fact, my daughter, my daughter passed away from sickle cell six days before. I found her dead in the room. So I gown up and I go, I brace myself and I go in the room. Um, she's laying on the bed, her eyes are partially open. She still had the gray scarf around her head. I, I rubbed her hair, I grabbed her hands. I cried and I promised her I made promises to her that she couldn't hear. And I said, the next time you open your eyes, I'm going to be there. I don't care where I am in the world, I'm going to be there. And I will be waiting for you. I will not marry again until I marry you again. And the next, the first thing I'm going to say to you is what you said to me when you called me after the crisis, I'm gonna to say to you, I'm still here. And I'm gonna to say to you what you said to me. And I'm gonna, and, 
And I told her, not only am I going to say I'm still here, but I said, I'm going to see to it that all four of my group, my or four of my children, remaining children, we lost two kids, or four of my children and all seven of my grandchildren are going to be present. And I'm going to say to you, we're still here. In fact, I have a wristband says I'm still here. And on the other side, it says, we're all here. Those are my promises I made to her. And then um, I realize um, when I got married 30, 29 years ago, this November 29th, this week would have been 29 years. When I got married, I was a mess. I was not ready for her. I wasn't even good enough for her. She transformed me. She transformed me into the man that I am. Everything you know about me has taken place with her at my side. I don't even know how to do this. I don't. I don't know how to do this. I don't want to do this. I went to a dark place a month ago. Um, I said I didn't want to live without her. I wasn't suicidal. I just didn't want to live without her. And the Lord had to call me into his office and have a conversation with me because life goes on and she would want me to go on with life. So that part I have to figure out. But here's what I know, here's what I know. And here's what I share. I have a ministry. The Lord said to me, the Lord said to me a couple of days after she got married, cause I can't stand social media. And my kids have been trying to get me on Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and whole nine yards. And I've been resisting. The Lord said, the Holy Ghost said to me, I want you to go on, I want you to go Facebook. I want you to go on social media and I want you to do a message. And here's the message. He gave me the message. He said, the message is entitled, when love is not enough. I said, and I heard him. I said, okay, Lord. And I went on and I did the presentation and that presentation blew up. So I said, oh, okay. And, and then the next week I came back, I did when love is not enough part two and that blew up. And then those messages, I made an appeal to husbands. And here's my appeal. And now I have individuals, I have couples who are contacting me. I have, I have women, I have a, a, a ministry just for women and they're contacting me and calling me and asking for help. And so here's what I, here's, here's my appeal. Here's my appeal. My appeal to men and husbands in particular is, take every day that you have to love and cherish your wife. Don't let one day go by with foolishness because I guarantee Mike and I will tell you that you need to experience everything that you can experience right now because you have no idea that she will be here next month, next week, next year. And so enjoy every day you can to the fullest right now, because when she's gone, you will wish that you had done all of that. And when she's gone, you will do the woulda, coulda, shouldas. And I wanna spare you from the woulda, coulda, shouldas. I thank God, I thank God. Amen, amen. I thank God that our relationship went into the stratosphere before she died. Because if it hadn't, if I had still been that knucklehead in the first seven years, the guilt would be eating me alive today. And I may not survive. I may not have survived the, the depression. And I, I may sub, I'm, the, the guilt may have caused me to do something harmful to myself because the guilt would have been so great. On top of me missing her. So my message is everybody, look, do the right thing today. 
because you can't guarantee tomorrow. Amen. Elder Leggett, there are some who perhaps may wonder why I would even ask you to join in with, with Mike. He already mentioned for him gone too soon started in 2019. And uh, for you, this is new, August. But you've already started a ministry that you are actively engaged in. And I have to pause right now and give a shout out to my, my buddy, Lori, who connected us together, who's we're celebrating. She's one of our individuals. We're celebrating her birthday and thank her for taking the time to do so and allowing this. This is something that you wanted to do because you're engaging in that through your ministry. And perhaps we can take time to do that as well, part one moving forward. But the both of you gentlemen have a message that is in unison as we, as listeners, listen to you. And Mike has already inferred that there are those who have lost their spouse, not just men on this call, but women on this call who have lost their spouse. There are those who have lost relationships, maybe not through death, but they've experienced it as it were because that relationship is no more. And so gentlemen, I, while I've, I've heard you say, enjoy the moments when you can, now give us a spiritual nugget as we close, because we know we can't do it all at one sitting, but a spiritual nugget that encourages those who are on to hold on. The song says, we have this hope. But what for you has been a spiritual nugget or a spiritual tip that can be shared with those who are listening, those who may listen in the future when they go to the, the site that tells them, ah, I, I think I can do that. So what comes to mind, Elder Miguel? Um, when Ann when, 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 when went into crisis, um, I went into biblical mode and I said, if Joshua and Israel can walk around Jericho once a day for six days and then seven times on the seventh day, then I certainly can walk around this hospital. And I started walking around. I did a prayer walk around the hospital once a day. And I did it for the Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. I did it for four days. Uh, and then she passed Friday morning. Um, and I went on air. Friday night because I had people who joined me in the journey and they be, had become a part of my family and I felt an obligation to share with them that Angela had succumbed uh, to the disease. She, she passed away from COVID. Um, and on that call, I made a determination. Here's what I stated to the people. I said, um, I'm a soldier. Um, and my commanding and my commander in chief, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, made an executive decision not to answer our prayer. I spent nights, all night in prayer where I never went to sleep. Nights, plural. And he chose not to answer that prayer. And I told them, I'm not angry with God. Because here's what I know. When Christ came to earth, he said, I came to seek and save the lost. Christ is in the saving business. And I know that if Christ came to me and said to me, Frank, you got two options. Um, I can answer your prayer and restore your wife, knowing that sometime down the future, she's going to make a left turn and she's going to end up in hell. Or I can allow her to go to sleep in me now. Which one would you choose? Obviously, the choice is clear. Choice is clear. So because I trust the Lord, and I know this is about salvation, and I also know finally, when Angela was in the hospital, she made two comments. And I, I, and I, and I rest peacefully because of those comments. She said, the Lord permitted this to happen to reach me because she was not comfortable with where she was 
Adventists all her natural born life, no, nothing else but the church, but she was not satisfied with where she was. She said, the Lord permitted this to happen to reach me and to save me. And number two, she said, I've confessed all of my sins, all the ones that I know I've committed and the ones that I'm, that I, that I'm unaware of, I have asked him to forgive me. So when my wife closed her eyes, I know she made a calling and election sure. And it, on top of my desire that I already had to want to be saved, seeing and being re reunited with her on resurrection morning is the greatest, is the greatest driving force of my life. But I trust him because mm. I know he's in the saving business. And I knew, he knew, he said, Frank, it's going to hurt but I'm saving her. And in the process, I'm gonna get two for one because you wanna see her so badly, you are gonna get your hind parts together. And I save her, I'm gonna end up saving you too. <laughs> Powerful. I'm gonna get two for one. Powerful, I appreciate that, Pastor. And there's, there's comments that are showing up and I know a little bit about these women that are commenting. I happen to know they both have lost their husbands. And so I want you gentlemen to know that it's not just the men, again, I'm saying it, there are individuals that are touched and who need to know, especially during this holiday season. And that's why some of you received that card and it referenced the holiday season. But that's because I, in some strange kind of way, I just wanted to remind you that there's still hope. I think for me, as I uh, walked doing the week, sharing some time with God and walking and doing my prayer time, I, for some reason, I came up with the analogy, Mike, that from time to time, we hear of robbers who come in and they take some of your most valuable things and they get away and they make break in through a window or this, that, and the other. But what happens when the enemy comes in Elder Leggett, and he thinks he's taken away some of your most precious things. He robs you of your, your joy and your peace and the ability to go to God because there's so much hurt and bitterness and anger there. And it, it would appear if in fact we allow God to take us through those experiences, not to say it's not gonna hurt, but if we allow him to do that, then he has promised us the assurance that he will go through it with us and we're not alone. So the scripture, cast all your care upon him for he careth for you. And the other scriptures, blessed are they that mourn for they shall be comforted. And then there's more, and I'm encouraged by that. But I think that every now and then we have to remind others who are mourning and going through that time, such as during this holiday time, where there are even greater reminders and empty chairs and homes and so forth, where one once sat or laid down, this is the time where we can offer hope. So gentlemen, uh, Mike, what's your nugget, your final nugget, before I say gentlemen with the final thought? Well, the word says all who live godly will suffer persecution. Yeah. You know, blessed are you who are persecuted for righteousness sake. We, we need to recognize that in this life to everything there is a season and a time. We weren't naive enough to believe that we would both die at the same time. And although there's never a good time to die, we need to be ready because in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, for any of us, one accident, one you know, my, my oldest sister died on a motorcycle and it was everything that was horrible to hear. I get a call in the middle of the night at three o'clock in the morning. Your sister was in a car accident. I mean, a motorcycle accident in Arizona. And, you know, she's on life supports and it's like, what do you do? You know, and you pray and you pray and you pray, but understand something about prayer. Prayer is not manipulating God. Prayer is God helping us to understand his will. Amen. And there are so many people who talk about healing by faith. And if you have enough faith, God will. 
uh, God, did, there was that woman at Nain, the widow of Nain had no faith. He said nothing to her. He just saw in his compassion her and walked up to that casket and healed her son. Did not say a thing. You know, um, the, the man at the pool of Bethesda didn't even know who Jesus was when Jesus came over and started talking to him. We need to recognize that, you know, we don't know everything. We act like we know the Bible completely and, and, and people will say the most stupidest thing. And that's the nicest way I can say it. The most stupidest thing to you in these times. I had somebody come up and castigate me because my wife did not do the conventional things that she should, should have done according to the doctors to help heal her from her cancer. And it was like, I just wish she had because she could have lived longer. And it's like, you don't know me and you don't know her and you don't know her relationship with her father. So don't tell me about how she should do what she's supposed to do. Let her do her thing and let her trust God to do what he knows is best for her. The nugget that I got from this is that God is in control because value, we were praying and praying and praying for her healing because we wanted her to be healed so that she could have a testimony for him. That's what we really wanted. We wanted her to have a testimony of how good God is and how in the midst of this suffering and in the midst of this sickness, God came through. But she said something kind of like uh, Frank said that his wife said, Angie said, she said, I'm his and he can do whatever he wants with me. So if he chooses to take me, I'm ready. I'm ready. I've been blessed beyond measure. I've led a full life. She said, I'm ready. But I want to live. But it's his decision. And I give it to him gladly. You know, I, I, I wish she had said some profound thing at the end to me right before she passed. You know, but like I said, there's never a good time. But the lesson that came out of it for me is afterwards and I was praying after she passed because I wasn't expecting her to pass and I was in pain and my pain was was magnified because I was always surrounded by people you know Adventists are so good on Sabbath we like to visit the sick and 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 do our just do on the Sabbath when I don't have work or anything else and I don't have to sacrifice to do it and so they came to visit Val at the hospital and they were all around and it wasn't just Adventists it was some good friends who had come by to really check on her and wanted her to know how much she was loved. And when she came home from the hospital, the hospital that she was at was less than half a mile from our house. So when they transported her from the hospital home, all those people who were at the hospital came over, there were 15 people in my house. And when we were setting up her room and the nurse said to me, I don't think she's got much longer. And there was a doctor who was in the house and when she passed within an hour after she got home, there were 15 people in my house. And as I was in there and my sons were in there with my wife, people are Facebooking and, you know, sharing the information. And my phone is blowing up and I'm in there with her cold body. And my phone is blowing up. People trying to call me and text me because all the information had gone out because people were in the house. And I was like, you know what? I just need some time alone, me and my maker, because I don't understand what just happened. And I don't know, Frank said it best, you know, when you're, when you're with somebody that you've been with for a long time, your hopes and dreams and plans are all wrapped up in that person. And when that person is not there anymore, what do you have to look forward to? What everything that I had planned in my future was around her. You know, you don't, you're in a happy marriage. You don't make a decision without her. Somebody says, well, you know, can you come over to this? And it's like, well, I got to check with the boss, you know, and we will see what we can work out or whatever. We always talk about everything. And now there's no one to check with. You are lost. And how do you all of a sudden come together? And people expect you to stand strong. And Frank's analogy was very good. I, I told enough people the other thing was this is a battlefield. Earth is a battlefield and we are all soldiers. And I said, like my partner, who was my teammate, and we were running and we were saving souls for the kingdom, got shot and killed in the foxhole with me. 
and I can stay here and hold her and cry and, and be sad, but that's not going to help me get to where I need to go. I have to let go and move forward. And I remember praying, what now, God? What now? And him saying to me, I'm not through with you yet. She took her exit off the freeway, but you're still driving. You keep letting me lead you. Yeah. And there are people on this call that I have been able to bless because I trusted him and didn't look to myself. And I didn't realize how many people I would be able to touch who had been through what I've been through now. And I did not realize that my brother-in-law said it best. And this was something that I really cherished. They said to me, he said, this is perfect for you. God gave you all the talents so you could deal with this and you could get through it. You are equipped for such a time as this. He said, I don't know anybody else who could have done it, but he made you with the gifts he made you so that you could get through it and help the family get through it and help my in-laws get through it and help others who are dealing with it get through it. So get through it. Amen. Amen. Hey, Deb, can I, Deb, Deb, can I share this one last thing? Mike, Mike, it caused me to realize something. Um, after Ann passed, um, I, I was in my, I was, I was in bed one morning and I said, Lord, I know you have a plan. I trust your plan. Share with me. What do you want to do with me now? I don't need to know today. I don't need to know tomorrow because I believe in blind faith and I trust you blindly, but in your time, just reveal to me what you have in store. Because I know you have something in store for me. And here's what God is revealing to me. God is saying, saying to me, I'm about to take you somewhere in the absence of your wife, in terms of your ministries, that I could not take you in the presence of your wife the impact will be greater with her in the grave and secure in salvation, with her gone than it, it would have been if she were by your side. Trust me, trust me, I got this. That's what he's now saying to me and I trust him. Amen. Well, gentlemen, it has, it has really been a delight in having both of you. I know there's a lot more that could be shared. You all were very transparent. You all allowed us to see your souls, to see your brokenness and to see how God has caused you to grow. And of course, Elder Leggett, this is still, you're still at the beginning. This has only been since August and yet already you're planting. And so I hope that in the future we can hear what it is that the ministry is, is now being, how it's being used, how you're being used to water and share with others. If it's all right with you gentlemen, maybe we'll take about five to seven minutes for some remarks. There've been a lot of remarks that have been put in the chat and, uh, Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to unmute, unmute, and I'll be happy to take some comments, remarks, or questions. Um, one person said, yeah, you always, definitely true about Val. You always knew how she felt about you. Definitely missed. That comes from Aaron. Lori, Lori says, you're doing a great job, Pastor. That's part of your cheerleading section, Pastor Leggett. Then one individual says, what a blessing this Zoom was for me today. Thank you, Michael and Frank, for sharing your beautiful stories. You both have touched so many. 
And I, for one, am grateful for you. And that's coming from Beverly Ward Gregg, continuing. Wow, this discussion was such a great blessing for me today. That's coming from S. Green. Not sure if that's a man or a woman, I'm sorry. Continuing with just two to three more powerful testimonies, Frank and Michael, I definitely needed to hear this today. The heartfelt sentiments I too share with losing my husband, Jerry. Thank you so much. And that comes from Robin Warren, Wilson Warren, Jerry's spouse. Continuing, thank you for sharing the beautiful memories and love for you, your wives. God continue to bless you with strength, and comfort from above and these around you, those around you as you hold steadfast to your faith in him. Not sure who that is, but thank you for that. My prayers for strength and comfort to all those who lost their husbands or wives. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That's a reminder from our guest, Michael. And then uh, this one. Thank you, Pastor Leggett and Michael Main, MM, for your powerful testimonies. It was very helpful. That's coming from Dr. Shell. All righty. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all of your remarks. Anybody with any questions or remarks, take, um, we'll take, do it about five to seven minutes, and then we're going to let these men have one final remark. And anybody else, and we'll have prayer over our guests. Anybody I, at all? I just have a uh, couple of men, a couple of comments. Yeah, hey, Doc. Um, I say to God, be the glory, man. Um, uh, man, you got me. You 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 have me a little emotional here today because you you take me down. A, you take me back down the road. Anyhow, uh, Pastor Leggett, I pray for you, and uh, I thank God that you were able to experience the joy of your life. Also, you too. Dr. Main, um, but God is good. I just wanted to shout out to you and say I appreciate your sharing, your testimony. To God be the glory. Love you, brother. God bless you. Frank. But you know, you know, we didn't tell you anything you didn't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. That's it. Took me down. Uh, took me back down the road, man. Yeah. God is good. God is good. Amen. Well, this is a question that comes in from Daryl White or Michael. What stage was Val when diagnosed? Is that okay for you to answer publicly? I can answer. It's um. It wasn't, I don't really remember, truth be told. I know that that's one of the regrets that we had. In all honesty, she did not have cancer removed because she wanted to use it as a gauge to determine if the um, treatment that she was doing was working. And so she wanted to see if it would shrink the tumor. And um, so she did not originally have it removed. And by the time that she got to the place where she was ready to have it removed, it was too late and they could not remove it. Uh, Val was kind of adamant about what her choices were and how she was going to follow that course of action. And she seemed to be like so in sync with her in touch with herself at peace with the decisions that she had made and having you on board to co-sign it but above all of that the fact that she and god were in partnership together as to whatever that outcome was on that journey seemed that that was her understanding 
and that was clear. Any other questions or comments? It's a, it's, this is Beverly. Um, Michael's nudging me back, back door to say something from a woman's standpoint. I do have to say this though. Um, this isn't about us women today. It's about how the Holy Spirit has used us today on this call. Um, you two gentlemen were so translucent, so deeply honest, and we don't get to hear that as women. We don't get to hear your feelings. And I know, Frank, it's raw for you. It's raw for me. It's raw for Rob and it's raw for Michael, several of us on here. But I think the blessing in all of this for me is that God puts people in your life at the perfect time to help lift your head up from the sorrow, take a few steps and get back on track with him. And that's the blessing I have received today. I can smile and say, I am loved, I have loved, and I need to be a blessing to others. And that's what you guys have equipped me with today. And I'm so grateful. Yeah. Thank you. Amen. 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 Thank you, Beverly. I appreciate those kind and gracious remarks. And as you mentioned, uh, you too have lost your, your husband. And of course, you recognize Robin because you were members of the same church. And we continue to keep Robin in prayer uh, for her. Jerry's passing was in January earlier this year, if I'm not mistaken. And then there are others, the gentleman that just spoke, Elder Benjamin, lost his wife it's been a few years ago but as he stated it has reminded him of some of the things and so it's, it's wonderful to, to have you be able to share uh, these things to encourage someone else along the way so Beverly again thank you for that thank you uh, there's another may, may I um is Robin oh hey may I just um, just quickly I would I quickly just want to thank you um, for acknowledging um, Jerry, and and I won't don't speak too much, but basically it was a really a good um, message today. Thank you guys for the beautiful testimonies, um, and even Beverly. Each person that spoke was very encouraging, and um, uh, I was going to say something earlier, but I forgot. But you know, we we kind of look at it. That's what it is. You know, it's thanking God each and every day. I mean, who would have thought we would be in this actual space, right? Mm -hmm. um, I don't think any of us intended to be here, but God teaches us to find peace in the pain. And that's one of the things, you know, I've been praying about each day. Every day is different. Some days are good days, other days are bad days. But when you look at your um, loved one and you think about the love um, that they, you know, carry throughout the, the marriage, but not even just that, just their, their lifelong character. I mean, for me, I would tell anyone the happiest moments were to be in a relationship with him in that uh, ministry partnership, you know, and it, just being a partner with him, no matter what it was. You know, my husband was a music musician, but he was in a sense a minister of the word, you know, and I just believed in wherever he went, I was there and I am just mm. ever so thankful to be able to support him and just to be there with him throughout his ministry. So with that, I am able to move forward. Um, and so I thank God for that. Thank you, Robin. I appreciate that. And we appreciate you. Uh, appreciate mm -hmm. continuing to connect with us from time to time. We really do. We appreciate it. Debbie? Yes. Hi, this is Miriam Battles. Hi there. Good and I just, you. thank you. I wanted to make a comment about um, Frank Leggett and um, just wanted to say, Frank, I, um, as I shared with you, I watched your Facebook journey and it was a powerful journey. It was an emotional journey. It was uh, a journey that, um, strongly declared your faith in God. And honestly, while the journey was occurring, I was very concerned as, oh Lord, what is going to happen? Will Frank make it if something happens to Anne? 
And that's the beauty that I saw in the whole thing. When something happened to Anne, your faith, Frank, remained strong in God. And your, your testimony that you were okay with God, that you were still um, as strongly connected with him as before was just a beautiful testimony. So I just wanted to reiterate that as one that personally shared in that Facebook journey. It was quite emotional, and um, but I'm so thankful that you are holding on to God and still holding on to him. Beautiful, beautiful testimony. And thanks so much for sharing. Love you, Miriam. Love you too, Frank. Thank you, Sister Battles. Appreciate that. One final one. One final remark or question. If not, I'm gonna do something a little different. It's our custom when we come together to have someone pray for our special guest. But if you would allow me, gentlemen, I'd like to find out if you'd be willing to pray for each other in this journey. That's all right with you. Yeah, I'd be honored. Did you want Absolutely. us to... Uh, closing remarks? Uh, I'll do so after you pray for each other and the acknowledgement of the sun as it begins to set here. Uh, but we'll connect and find out about uh, Elder Leggett and his program and the opportunity to share with one another. But yeah, let's go ahead and pray. Elder Leggett, would you start first if you would be so kind? Father God, I come to you on behalf of my friend, Dr. Michael Main. I had the privilege of being at Oakwood with Michael and Michelle. We sang in the Way Back When Choir together. We go back a whole lot of years. And now he shares, unfortunately, a similar experience with me, but I am so, I am so encouraged by his testimony. I'm so encouraged by his faith in you. Because of my testimony, I've had individuals contacting me saying, Pastor, I am so grateful for you that you remain faithful because when my loved one died, when my mother died and my husband died, I, my father, I got angry with God. And when I saw you and you were not angry, you touched me. And so I'm, I'm grateful to my friend. He's got a gaping wound in his heart and I know what that's like and I don't wish that for anybody, but it's Faith in you has remained intact. Bless him. Bless his sons. Heal them. Be with them. Take them from where they are to exactly where you want them to be. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And Lord, when that happens, we're going to be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise. Yes. In Jesus' name, I ask it. Amen. 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 And Lord of love, as we linger in your presence, Lord, I just pray that you would give a double blessing on Frank. Lord, I just thank you for rekindling our friendship, for reminding us of how much you love us, and bringing it full circle so that we can help one another as one hand washes the other, helping us to help cleanse and wash and support one another. I just thank you, Lord. I pray now that you would enlarge his territory, that you would bless his ministry, but Lord, more importantly, that you would manifest yourself in him in such a way that he can see you more clearly and reflect you more dearly. Lord, may his heart be healed as he recognizes that one day he will spend eternity with his father and his love. Lord, may you bless his children that they also may be, as he stated, where you want them to be and where they can be saved in your kingdom forever too. 
Just like you can save us, Lord, you can save them. Amen. I pray for everyone on this call, Lord, who has heard our testimony, who has suffered loss, who, Lord, may be struggling with just life. Help them to understand that it's your will and your way that is what's most important and that they can trust you. Even when it doesn't look good, even when it doesn't feel good, they can trust you, Lord. May you be glorified. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts continue to be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, for you are our strength and our redeemer. May we take you with us throughout this entire week, is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for your willingness to pray for one another as you have prayed for one another. I hope that you are encouraged by the fact that you are not alone. Not only are your journeys similar, but now you have a host of individuals who have shared this afternoon with you, some of them with brokenness, some of them discouraged, some of them not quite sure if they're gonna make it through the holiday. And you have given a glimpse of hope. But more important, it's a reminder that when we don't forsake the assembly, uh, the gatherings that come together in this manner, we seem to come away with something that draws us closer to him when we allow ourselves to be made available to his prompting and his bidding. I wasn't quite sure about doing this program when first presented with the opportunity. And then I thought, well, I wanna bring Michael to the table too, knowing that it's a sensitive topic and one that we don't always speak about like this. But I can assure you that there are those who are indeed grateful and blessed for having spent this valuable time together. Concerts are good and Sabbath school is, is yeah, it's inspiring and can be very encouraging as well. But this did something for our souls in a different way. So thank you for your willingness, gentlemen, to come together in this manner. May the way you've blessed us today be returned to you tenfold and more as we move into the last month of this year. And may you know that even when we're separated, we're still all praying for you and each other on this call. As we conclude, I just want to remind you of the... And, and, and you don't realize that you're cliffing. So you are falling and there's no way you can help yourself. And it's just you being transparent. And when I started, I was teaching a Sabbath school class and I started talking about um, just one day we're going to be resurrected. You know, one day when Jesus comes again, we'll see him as he are, as he is. And when we're, when those who are alive and remain are caught up in the air to meet those who have passed, we're not going to see them as they were. We're going to be changed in a moment in a twinkling of an eye. It won't be the sick vow that I will see. It'll be the healthy vow. It won't right. be the sick and Jesus or and that you see, but the healthy one, the one, right. you know, it, <laughs> like you said from the video you know and just that blessed hope man just you know there is no pain no sickness no suffering that that promise and it just you know you'll be preaching in one and you won't know why well you'll know why but it won't it will be something that you can't control but that sure. may be how does somebody say it that may be the stone that takes out somebody's giant so don't be afraid to be transparent with it and cast that stone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm telling you, man, it's just, it's a, I, like I told somebody else, I would have never chosen this journey. I, it wouldn't no. have been my choice. No. But, but that's, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave you with this poem. The, the poem said, Why must I weep while others sing to test the depths of suffering? Why must I work while others rest to spend my strength 
at God's request. Why must I lose while others gain? To understand defeat's sharp pain. Why must this life of why must this lot of life be mine when that which fairer seems is thine? Because God knows just what for me shall blossom in eternity. Amen. 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 An honor, brother. My pleasure. Um, I am starting, and Mike, we, we need to talk because do you remember Al Freeman from Oakwood? Yeah. Al's wife passed away. No. Yeah, COVID. Yeah, the funeral no, was. Al just got married not too long ago, right? Ten? Like, no. Like... No, no. They've been married for 50 years. Al Fre oh, Al Freeman. Little short Al? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right, yeah. right, right, right. I'm thinking, yeah. I'm thinking of Alfred Brown. Sorry, Alfred Brown. Okay, Al yeah, Freeman. Al Freeman. Yeah. His wife I passed know. away. I, I believe the funeral was this past Sunday. Oh my! Um, so you know, I've reached out to him, James, Pastor James Lewis. Pat, he was former pastor of Allegheny West. His wife passed away, uh, September, October. Um, so I'm in the process of contacting people. Uh, so we just, you know, we just need to talk. Al and I cried on the phone yesterday, man. Um, tell him, tell him hello when you talk to him for me. I, I, I will. Tried, I tried to help people. I tried to tell people the stuff that I never knew when my wife passed. Like I just told you about, you know, your the people coming up sure. to you and different things. Like one of sure. the things that freaked me out was after she passed, I started sleeping through the night. And I thought that that was kind of strange. And I felt very guilty because now right. I was sleeping. Whereas right. before, like you were saying, you're up all night praying and, I'm praying. and, and I'm listening for her call, you know, so that I can do whatever I can. I mean, I'd, I slept, you know, like when we had children, when you first have children, because anything that they need, you're ready to jump up and do to help. Absolutely. And so yeah. um, the body knows when to let down. And so after she passed, I sleep through the night and I felt guilty. But it was my body saying, now you don't have to stay up. Now you don't have to be stressed. Now right. you can relax and let right. yourself just kind of come back to equilibrium. And right. I, again, I felt guilty, but it was like, I needed to understand, no, this is God giving you the peace that people have been praying for, for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. don't be surprised when stuff like that happens. Good, good. Don't let others define good. it for you either. You define it. Oh, absolutely. You and absolutely. God. Absolutely. But who am I talking absolutely. to? I'm talking to a preacher. Come on now. <laughs> Look, we, Mike, we don't know everything. We don't know everything. Some Trust some of us think some of us think we do, but we don't. I, I don't know if you know, but my dad was a pastor. I am a PK. You know, I think stopped, I, rem I think I remember that. I remember he stopped, that. He stopped preaching when I was about eight years old, but but I okay. you know, I was raised a PK and you know, uh, lived perfect in front of the world. You know. Yeah. Yes. So, so trust me, I know. But you know what? God has a plan, and it's a perfect. Yes, yes, he does. And I trust him. Absolutely. Me too. Learning more every day. And I think every part day. of our process is helping others to learn to trust him too. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So and keep I, hope. And I, I, I will continue yeah. to pray. I'll get your number. So yes, absolutely. Let's, let's talk. All right. Love you, man. God bless you. Love you too. Yes, sir. Thank you for joining us once again. It has been so nice to have this time of fellowship with you. May the Lord bless and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you and grant you and yours peace. Until then, take care of yourselves and each other. For more information about this program, This Is My Story, Testimonies That Move the Soul, see us at our website. We look forward to seeing you next time. Take care.